Assalamu alaikum. My name is Tehseen Muzaffar. I'm currently the uh, professor and interim chair of Department of Neurology at University of California, Irvine. And my talk today is going to be on myasthenia gravis, which is a disorder of the neuromuscular junction, um, mostly seen by neurologists, but also can be seen by patients um, that present to ophthalmology as well as medicine um, services. On the screen here, I am reflecting a neuromuscular junction with the terminal nerve fibers ending onto the acetylcholine receptor uh, um, receptors. Myasthenia gravis in neurology is a perfect example of an autoimmune disease. In this particular disease, we know that there is a known antigen, which is the acetylcholine receptor. In majority of the cases, the antigenicity is against the entire unit of the acetylcholine uh, receptor, including the two alpha units, the gamma units, as well as the delta units. Now, there are special cases where the autoimmunity may be directed against any one subunit of this um, receptor. We know that the thymus gland plays an important role in generation of this autoimmunity. And that's why thymectomy or surgical removal of thymus is an important treatment consideration. We also know that there has to be genetic susceptibility um, and patients who get myasthenia often have the genetic susceptibility by means of a Myasthenia gravis is usually the DR3, DQA1, and DQB1 haplotypes that put people at risk for myasthenia gravis. We also know that there is alpha units, uh, alpha subunit polymorphism of the receptor that also modulates um, disease phenotype in myasthenia gravis. More importantly, in this particular case, uh, we know that in myasthenia gravis, there are known antibodies that are pathogenic. These are serum IgG antibodies that are directed against the acetylcholine receptors. Uh, it's a sustained immune response and it is dependent on T-cell help to sustain itself. The figure out here, as sh shown by this mouse, are the acetylcholine receptors on a muscle biopsy. The background is muscle. So at the edge of the muscle um, fiber, you can see these receptors stained with alpha bunglotoxin. Now, in a normal neuromuscular junction, you have the presynaptic terminal, which is the nerve terminal. The nerve terminal, can, which are the acetylcholine-filled vesicles. And you have a postsynaptic membrane that usually in a normal configuration has a lot of crevices uh, and surface area. And the advantage of that is that there are many more acetylcholine receptors present in these surface area and these crevices. Because myasthenia is an immune attack and it is, com it is a complement mediated immune attack, standing myasthenic patients, you have simplification of the postsynaptic membrane with simplification of the crevices. So you have less surface area available. You also have less amount of receptors that are available. Please note that the presynaptic membrane is unchanged in myasthenia gravis. This is in sharp contrast to other diseases of the neuromuscular junction where the pathology seems to be in the presynaptic. Myasthenia gravis is a postsynaptic muscle disorder. So in myasthenia, the defect is reduced number of acetylcholine receptors. We think there is reduced function depending on the nature of the antibodies. Your synaptic synaptic clefts are widened and your postsynaptic membrane is damaged and simplified. This is a actual um, electron microscopy from human patients. Um, take so as, as we showed you on the cartoon, you have the presynaptic nerve terminal with a number of vesicles. You had postsynaptic membrane with a number of um, this crevices with a large number of receptors noted by these black dots, which are gold label 
acetylcholine receptors. Whereas in a patient with myasthenia gravis, you can see that in con contrast to the normal neuromuscular junction, you have a very simplified, much reduced uh, postsynaptic membrane. And this is where the physiological problem in neuromuscular junction happens. So myasthenia gravis is essentially a failure of neuromuscular transmission. You have partially damaged neuromuscular junctions and every end plate potential does not generate an action potential. So you have failure of neuromuscular transmission. Normal neuromuscular transmission has a safety factor built into it where each end plate potential will generate an action potential, but that does not happen in myasthenia gravis. As a result, you get fatigue, which is worse with repeated use. And this is true neuromuscular fatigue where you get muscle weakness in response to fatigue. So there's a gentleman on the left side who can open his eyes, but with repeated action, your, um, the eye muscles become weak and they start drooping. These neuromuscular junctions are also very sensitive to neuromuscular junction blocking agents, such as succinylcholine, um, tuberculari uh, form agents. And that's why one of the reasons we avoid these neuromuscular junction um, agents in anesthesia for myasthenic patients. And then if you do not uh, immunosuppress them, and if you allow the immune attack to, to continue, at some point, these neuromuscular junctions become non-functional. There's a point of no return and it results in static weakness, um, a permanent weakness of the muscles. In general, it's a generalized weakness. Um, this is a disease that affects pretty much all muscles of the body, but some muscles are more susceptible. So triceps in the upper extremity, quadriceps in the lower extremity um, are very susceptible to myasthenic symptoms, and those are usually the weakest muscles. Head ptosis or head drop is very common. And then arms in general are much more affected than the legs. In extraocular muscles, because they have a low fatigue index, tend to get affected much easier. Um, and then bulbar muscles, especially speaking difficulty, uh, swallowing difficulty can manifest uh, as part of the myasthenic syndrome. Um, respiratory failure can also happen and it's not unusual for some patients who may have had subclinical myasthenia gravis to manifest for the first time after surgery um, and, they are, and they have difficulty coming off for ventilator. Um, so if you have patients in the ICU who are not coming off the ventilator, remain dependent on ventilators, think about myasthenia gravis as a possibility. Um, other differential diagnoses include congenital myasthenic syndromes, which are often genetically determined mutations of the uh, essential proteins in the neuromuscular junction and present at birth, but sometimes can present in adolescence or adulthood. Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, which is a paraneoplastic syndrome, where you have antibodies to the voltage get gated calcium channels. Um, it's a presynaptic disorder. Botulism, which can happen either as part of an infantile botulism syndrome, or as part of a foodborne botulism syndrome where the canned foods get infected, or as a result of wound botulism, either because of an infected wound, or in, in the US where there is a lot of um, wound infections in skin poppers. These are IV drug addicts who run out of veins and they start popping their skin. Um, diphtheria is unfortunately on the rise especially in the Western world where children are not getting immunized for diphtheria. And then Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a common neuromuscular syndrome, can also look like myasthenia gravis. The most, um, <clears throat> the, in terms of diagnostic testing, repetitive nerve stimulation, which is done as part of nerve conduction studies, is a very useful test. Um, it is really dependent on which muscles you're testing. So as a rule, we recommend that we do this test study only on weak muscles. It's done at three hertz stimulation and you give repeated stimulation to the nerve um, recording from the muscle and you can demonstrate fatigue. So in this particular case, 
you can see that the, the maximal response of the first stimulus um, starts going down with repeated stimulus. And usually by fourth stimulus, it's the lowest and then tends to recover. So as a result, you get a normal U-shaped curve because of the fatigue. It is a very sensitive test. It's, a, it's seen in about 80% of patients with myasthenia gravis. However, it's not specific. You can, you can get an abnormal nerve stimulation. In neuropathy, you can see it in motor neuron disease, even in some forms of myopathy. Single fiber EMG test, which is a highly specialized nerve conduction study in EMG, only available in a few specialized centers, is a very sensitive test. Again, it's 100%, almost 100% sensitive. Um, especially if done from either a face muscle um, or um, orbicularis oculi, which is an eye muscle. Um, the problem again with single fiber EMG is that it's time consuming. It's not the most pleasant test. Patients don't tolerate it very well, but there's also a very high false positive rate, especially in patients with myopathy, with motor neuron disease, and with peripheral neuropathies. The most specific test for myasthenia gravis is to detect serum antibodies against, acetyl, against acetylcholine receptors. These um, are present in up to 85 to 90% of adults with generalized myasthenia gravis. The incidence is lower with ocular myasthenia gravis where only 50 to 70% of the patients may have antibodies. Childhood myasthenia gravis even has a lower incidence of 50%. And sometimes you can get false positives, especially with patients who have thymoma, where up to 100% of patients may have antibodies. And treatment with D-penicillamine, which is oftentimes used in neurological disorders, you can get a true seropositive myasthenia gravis, which usually responds to discontinuation of penicillamine therapy. Now, these are IgG1 and IgG3 antibodies. Um, in myasthenia gravis, which means that they are complement fixing, whereas IgG2 and IgG4 antibodies usually do not uh, fix complements. And we know that the antibody concentration and antibody titers um, vary significantly, um, but also correlate with disease um, severity. Um, there are cases of what we call seronegative myasthenia gravis, where the, an the antibodies to acetyl choline receptor anti, uh, antibodies are absent. These are much more common with ocular myasthenia gravis and especially in childhood disease. Um, and there may be other antibodies instead of the acetylcholine receptor antibodies and that may be present, especially antibodies to musk that I will mention in a few, few minutes. So musk antibodies are another um, neuromuscular junction protein. This is present um, right next to the acetylcholine receptor. It's a protein that normally for it to function has to be phosphorylated. And there is a cascade that happens that results in phosphorylation of musk. This whole mechanism is relatively new. This was discovered in the 1980s. And what we understand happens is that agrin, which is released by the presynaptic membrane, um, causes um, activation of LRP4, which then phosphorylates musk, and phosphorylation of musk results in movement of DOC7, which ultimately clusters the acetylcholine receptor. If you don't have that, then you, you cannot get neuromuscular junction transmission. Um, musk, therefore, plays a very important role in neuromuscular junction transmission as well. So we know that they about 6% of patients with myasthenia gravis have musk antibodies rather than acetylcholine receptor antibodies. These are IgG4 antibodies, so they don't fix complement. Um, usually, thymus has no role in this form of myasthenia. It can happen in children and adults, but most of the cases are female, and most of the cases are of European Caucasian descent. Um, there are very few cases where you had antibodies to both acetylcholine receptors as well as musk. Now, one peculiar um, feature of musk and uh, myasthenia is that the weakness seems to be restricted to facial and bulbar muscles. 
it's almost rare to see pure ocular myasthenia with musk. And as I mentioned, there is no role of thymus pathology in this particular form of myasthenia gravis. This form of disease also does not respond to pyridostigmine. Um, and some patients actually get worse with pyridostigmine. And the nerve conduction studies may be minimally abnormal in this particular form. So if you suspect musk antibody syndrome, the best thing would be to do the blood test for musk antibodies. We, we know that majority of these patients um, are require two or more treatment forms, um, usually in this case. And as you can see, up to um, 36 percent of the patient, up to 36 patients required all of these agents, including pyridostigmine, prednisone, immunosuppression, um, plasma exchange, or IVIG. So the, the notion is that patients with musk antibody tend to have more severe disease and a little bit more difficult to control. I would also like to talk of, um, a few minutes for about myasthenia, myasthenia crisis. Myasthenia crisis is usually when you have subacute onset of severe myasthenia related weakness uh, with resulting in impending respiratory failure. These are patients who need to be hospitalized, oftentimes put in the intensive care unit um, to prevent um, respiratory um, failure. There's often severe bulbar dysfunction and these patients require an NG tube or a feeding tube to be um, fed. Now, the other um, disease, that other um, feature of the disease can, that can do that is a cholinergic crisis where the patients may be taking too much pyridostigmine and essentially have over excess of the cholinergic stimulation. That usually presents with small pupils, excessive salivation, in cramps, but cholinergic crisis is incredibly rare. So most patients who are doing poorly and require hospitalization are true myasthenic related crises rather than cholinergic crisis. These patients need to be admitted to the ICU. They need to be watched very carefully. If they get respiratory failure, it's, prob it's important that they be intubated early or treated with BiPAP or CPAP, um, and any offending agents such as medications should be avoided. Um, the, one of the biggest uh, culprits for causing myasthenia crisis is IV magnesium, which is com very commonly used in medical ICUs, but that can very rapidly block neuromuscular junctions and cause myasthenic crisis. Myasthenia gravis um, really was a grave disease in the early 20th century, and that's where the name myasthenia gravis came from. However, with the advances in medication, with the advances in treatment of myasthenia gravis, and more importantly, advances in ICU care, myasthenia is no longer as grave of a disease as we, it used to be in the early 1900s and 1930s. Um, in 1934, neostigmine was introduced by Mary Walker, Dr. Blaylock did his first thymectomy in 1939. Steroids were introduced in the 1960s. In 1975, the Mayo Clinic group um, did their first plasma freezes or plasma exchange, and a number of medications were made available over the next 20, 30 years, um, including most recently the introduction of Eclusimab, which is a monoclonal antibody to complement Cascade. Um, and it was approved by the U.S. Drug Administration in 2017. So the current treatment of myasthenia gravis is hinged around a combination of corticosteroids, such as prednisone or prednisolone, with a low dose of pyridostigmine, um, usually at a dose of 60 milligrams two to three times a day. Now, if you suspect that somebody is going to be requiring a large amount of prednisone or is going to be on prednisone for a number of months, it's probably a good idea to start a steroid sparing medications early. Um, and pretty much you have a choice of any of these medications listed here, such as azathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil, which also known as Celsept, methotrexate, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, 
And now in the US and in some other countries, rotoximab, which is a CD20 inhibitor, can also be used. If somebody has myasthenic crisis and is at risk for getting admitted to the hospital, they should be treated with rescue therapy such as intravenous immunoglobulins or plasma exchange. Patients under the age of 50 and above the age of 15 should be considered for surgical removal of the thymus gland, and that's where the role of thymectomy is. And then there are newer therapies that are coming in. I am not going to talk about it much except for a brief mention, but there are a number of clinical trials that are undergoing right now to look at better treatment of myasthenia gravis. So it, the treatment of myasthenia gravis really depends on how fast and how urgent you want to treat the patient. If somebody is in crisis and you need them to improve over a matter of days, then it's probably prudent to use plasma exchange or IVIG. If you want to have show improvement in minutes, then anticholinesterase such as pyridostigmine is probably the way to go. And this is why we use it in ocular myasthenia or mild forms of myasthenia gravis. If you have time on your hand and you can do this as an outpatient um, with slow improvement, then prednisone is the drug of choice or prednisolone. And then you can add a combination of steroid sparing agents such as cyclosporin A, cyclosphosphamide, azathioprine, methotrexate, um, mycophenolate, etc. In the US and in the European Union, eclusimab, which is a monoclonal antibody directed against the terminal complement cascade, C5 through C9B, is an approved medication. And we can use it in situations where the first line medication, such as prednisone, and often a second line medication such as azathioprine and methotrexate have failed. Um, and then th there are newer medications that are being tried and we will, uh, this includes a whole class of medication that are antagonist of the, um, the fetal um, uh, um, receptors for the immunoglobulins called FCRN um, and that. And there are at least four different drugs that are being in this market all of them under clinical trials right now. Thymectomy clearly has a role and we'll talk about the data from the thymectomy trial, which is a very interesting set of data as well. So this is a table that I had made um, a few years ago, um, really depending on how you decide who needs to be treated. So the first question, the first issue is if somebody has a new onset seropositive, which means acetylcholine receptor positive, generalized myasthenia gravis, and notice I said generalized, not ocular, then you, the first determination you have to make is whether they have thymoma on chest CT, or they do not have thymoma on chest CT. If they have thymoma, then they need to have surgery to remove the thymus. If they don't have thymoma, depending on their age, so if they're less than eight and they're greater than 55 years of age, you don't do surgery, you only treat them with medical treatment. But if they are greater than eight years and less than 55 years, then you extend time, you do an extended thymectomy, whether you do it as a sternal um, procedure, whether you do it as a robotic procedure, doesn't really matter. And then oftentimes these patients have to be given IVIG or plasma exchange immediately in the preoperative period. And once they recover from that, you start them on prednisone with 10 milligrams daily and then bringing it up to 20 milligrams daily. The realization that most of these patients with myasthenia do not require more than 20 milligrams of prednisone or prednisolone a day. Now in certain situations, such as patients who are pregnant, patients who are under the age of 25, or patients who have either a history of cancer or diabetes, you would like to use uh, you would like to avoid prednisone. And these are the patients that I would either start directly on a immunosuppressive agent or do IVIG monotherapy on that. And if patients who have failed prednisone or prednisolone and have failed one of these immunosuppressants, you can consider a second line of treatment, which includes rituximab, chronic IVIG or chronic plasma exchange, Eclusimab, which is known as Solaris in the US, 
or these are the patients that you probably want to put on clinical trials if they are available in your area. <coughs> Despite the advances in treatment of myasthenia gravis, 10% of the patients remain refractory. They don't respond to any of these treatments. And 20% of patients may have good response, but they have serious or problematic side effects from the medications. We, as I mentioned before, we know that patients with musk myasthenia do not respond as well to conventional treatment. And then patients uh, in myasthenic crisis, um, especially um, in, uh, when they're not responding to immunoglobulins uh, or plasma exchange may not be available at your medical center. They ha we have to give them something that is a little bit more persistent. And this was a focus of the treatment guidelines um, from the International Treatment Guidance uh, Group that you, that you ideally should have a drug which is labeled as XXX that should be um, a good maintenance therapy for patients who are ref have refractory myasthenia or in those in whom immunosuppressive medications are relatively contraindicated because of comorbidity or because of pregnancy. So plasma exchange clearly has a role. This is an invasive procedure. It often requires a central line and therefore it is reserved mainly for patients who have acute uh, exacerbation of myasthenia requiring hospitalization. Um, it's also used sometimes in patients who are about to go, undergo surgery, uh, especially for thymectomy. Um, but it's not a good idea to use it for a long-term maintenance therapy. Although having said that, we have a few patients who do not respond to anything else and we have to use chronic plasma exchange. The advantage is it's a very short onset of action. It usually works within three to 10 days. The disadvantage is it's a high cost because it requires special equipment and personnel. Not all hospitals have access to plasma exchange and there are complications, especially in the elderly. You can have problems with calcium levels. You can have problems with albumin levels and clotting factors. The benefit is, is fast, but it's short term. It only um, stays for weeks. And the usual dose that we give are five exchanges of uh, plasma exchanges over eight to 10 days, usually 1.5 times the blood volume. IVIG is a very good drug, especially for acute myasthenic crisis. Um, and it's been looked at in systematic um, scientific um, reviews. Uh, where the response rate is about 73% of all myasthenics respond to IVIG. The average time of clinical improvement is about four to five days. Um, it's really um, the main role for it is in myasthenic crisis where the patients need to be treated um, for rapid improvement. But we, we can use it as a steroid sparing agent, especially in patients who are requiring a high dose of steroid and you have not yet started them on immunosuppressant, you can use a short course of IVIG to bring down the dose of prednisone. Um, and remember, most immuno, uh, steroid sparing agents take about three to six months to fully kick in. Um, so unless you use IVIG, you may not be able to reduce their dose of prednisolone. The induction dose is two grams per kilogram over two to five days. Um, maintenance dose is anywhere from 0.4 to 1 gram per kilogram. Um, uh, ideally, uh, uh, most ideally it's given every three weeks, but it can be given every four weeks, or there are patients who may require more frequent than every three weeks than that. There have been randomized blinded IVIG studies, one, one done by Lauren Zinman, who's in Toronto, Canada. Uh, they had 51 patients in that study. Not all of them were seropositive. Uh, the criteria was the patients had to have worsening weakness. They were given IVIG versus 5% dextrose as a placebo, and the doses were given over two days. And the primary outcome measure was the change in, qual in quantitative myasthenia gravis score at day 14. And the secondary outcomes were quantitative myasthenia gravis score change at day 28, single fiber EMG study and electrical studies as well. And, and Lon showed that there is a clear benefit of IVIG, 
of patients who received IVIG improved versus only 6% of patients who were receiving placebo. Um, only patients with more severe uh, myasthenia with a baseline quantitative myasthenia gravis score of greater than 10 showed improvement, uh, but it was not as obvious in mild or ocular myasthenia. Um, and there were no differences on nerve conduction studies. One of the big problems with IVIG is it causes headaches. And 75% of patients in this particular study who were on IVIG experienced significant headaches as well. Um, you can, uh, especially uh, one of the ways to mitigate the headache is to use subcutaneous immunoglobulins, which is now available through a number of companies. Um, in this particular retrospective study, uh, nine patients who were uh, class two or class three myasthenia. Um, all were on prednisone and one immunosuppressant agent um, were tried on 20 grams per week of sub-QIG um, and all showed improvement. Um, the myasthenia gravis activities of daily living improved. Myasthenia gravis quality of life 15 improved um, and there were no major side effects except for bruising um, and some pruritus at the site of injection. And then finally, thymectomy is a very important uh, treatment in the treatment of generalized myasthenia gravis. Um, we tend to reserve it for patients which is between the ages of 8 and 55. It definitely needs to be done in patients who have a thymoma uh, because the thymoma can be malignant. And it's done as an elective procedure, never an emergent uh, procedure. Um, if somebody is not doing well, it's probably better to get them improved on IVIG or plasma exchange before you subject them to surgical thymectomy. The, it's a very low morbidity, especially if it's done as a non-invasive or minimally invasive procedure. Um, disadvantage is that the, um, you need experienced surgeons um, and the patient has to be stable. As I mentioned, the classical surgical approach was transternal, where you had to crack open the chest. Um, some surgeons do it as transcervical, going above the suprasternal notch. And then nowadays, most of these done, uh, most of these are done as minimally invasive robotic surgeries, uh, often with a substernal approach. On that. Uh, for the longest time, there was a question about whether thymectomy works or not, till it was finally settled in this um, landmark paper in New England Journal of Medicine. This was a 10-year-long um, funded, uh, federally funded um, surgical trial of thymectomy versus no thy thymectomy in my senior gravis patient. patient. Um, I was part of this trial and uh, an author on this paper. Um, and it, this is a paper that um, ultimately randomized 150 patients, close to 150 patients um, between 2006 and 2012 at 36 sites across the world to either treatment with thymectomy or treatment with prednisone alone. So patients who received thymectomy were immediately put on prednisone, whereas the control group did not have thymectomy, only had prednisone. There were no sham surgeries on this but the, the evaluators were blinded to whether they had, the patient had surgery or not. This is a remarkable um, um, paper because you can see that the separation between patients who received thymectomy versus patients who were taking prednisone alone happened very early. So the, the conventional wisdom used to be that it took, takes about a year before thymectomy effect shows up. This paper clearly showed that the effect of surgery may happen as early as four weeks and even eight weeks, where the patients who did thymectomy and were then put on prednisone versus patients who were only put on prednisone, uh, the patients with thymectomy did much better with a lower quantitative myasthenia gravis score. In, in terms of QMG or quantitative myasthenia gravis score, the lower, the better it is. Same thing was, sh was shown in the dose of prednisone used. So this, in this particular study, they looked at the average daily dose of prednisone. So patients who received a thymectomy and then were put on prednisone versus patients who were prednisone alone, the thymectomy group did better with, with a much lower dose of prednisone 
over the next three years compared to patients with prednisone alone. Similar data was shown for use of acetyoprine. So if you look at my arrow, patients who received thymectomy required much less um, start of immune, uh, azathioprine versus patients who were on prednisone alone. Um, the same thing was seen with IV IGUs. Patients required less rescue therapy. M majority of these patients with surgery went into what's called a minimal manifestation status compared to patients who were prednisone alone. And then if the, any which way that you look at um, the prednisone dose, was superior in the thymectomy arm compared to the prednisone alone arm as well. So I'm not gonna talk about some of the newer or fancier um, treatments that are um, available in myasthenia. Um, these are often incredibly expensive medications that are probably not available um, outside the US as readily, um, including eclusimab, which costs upwards of $400,000 a year in the US. But um, what I want to really emphasize is that patients who are not doing well um, with myasthenia gravis really constitute a huge disease burden. Um, if somebody's myasthenia is doing not well, it has impact on their activities of daily living. It has impacts on their health-related quality of life. Um, it affects their work life and their source of income because they have many more days um, being out of work, and then they also utilize hospitals and doctor's offices much more. Um, as, as said, the physical symptoms um, are, um, are cause a substantial impact on their activities of daily living. Um, the biggest offender of that is if they have muscle weakness, especially of the uh, upper extremities, um, walking problems, swallowing difficulty, chewing difficulty, um, double vision or droopy eyelids, speech disturbance, all of this ultimately affect their quality of life and the activities of daily living. Um, and, and as you can see um, on this graph, which is plotting their SF36 quality of life domains, patients with um, acetylcholine receptor antibody, uh, myasthenia, which is purple, really have quite high significant impact on quality of lives. But this is also true for other forms of myasthenia as well. And finally, um, the health resource utilization is incredibly high in myasthenia. Patients who um, have myasthenia um, require um, a large amount of hospital admissions as well as outpatient visits. On an average, we tend to see our myasthenic patients every two to three months, um, and some of the more severe ones you often seen once a month. Their medications have to be adjusted. The, the insurance requires us to see them on an average about four to six times a year. And then, um, um, as I said, a lot of these patients are requiring um, either um, oral immunosuppressive therapy, such as prednisolone or azathioprine, um, but another number of them are taking more than two immunosuppressive agents. A good 12% of these patients are requiring chronic intravenous immunoglobulin, which is an expensive therapy. And then about 3% require chronic plasma exchange therapy, which is also a invasive as well as expensive therapy. Um, and there are significant side effects with all of these therapies. Uh, and this also in contributes to the cost, the quality of life, as well as burden of disease. Um, all of these medications have significant gastrointestinal side effects. Some of them have cardiovascular as well as um, infectious side effects. Um, there's organ toxicity, especially with azathioprine, um, with cyclosporin, um, and there are metabolic defects um, such as uh, diabetes, osteoporosis, osteopenia, um, with some of these treatments as well. So it's not a trivial treatment, it's not a benign treatment. A lot of these patients require chronic um, medical monitoring of their um, medical conditions that are caused because of the treatments that they're taking for myasthenia gravis. So there are aetrogenic um, problems that we create with treatment of myasthenia gravis. So I'm gonna stop here at this point. Um, my email address is 
m o z a double f a r at u c i dot e d u. Um, feel free to drop me an email if you have questions or concerns. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions. Again, it's m o z a double f a r at u c i dot e d u. Thank you.